Coming up, yes, the Brooklyn Nets should want to get into the 2024 NBA draft, but could a pick pivot result in them getting a forgotten sixth overall talent? We go ahead and dive in on the Josh Giddy of it all coming up next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, yes, my friends, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. He's Doug Norrie. I'm Adam Armbrick. We thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. We are 100% free on all those great platforms. And let you know this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Doug, as we assume the NBA finals will be coming to a close very shortly. The offseason and moves can officially begin the conversations about draft night picks. And on the heels of discussing a Dorian Finney-Smith trade, it did get my wheels turning about maybe getting a player, established NBA talent, rather than going the route of a week 2024 class. Yeah, so we know that there's going to be some teams that are looking to move off uh, different guys. And a guy that we had actually floated earlier in the season as a possible guy that the Nets uh, should target. And then he got himself in a little bit of like sort of controversial hot water, of which he's been seemingly cleared of now, uh, was one Mr. Josh Giddy. At the time, uh, we po- threw it out there like wondering if uh, like a Claxton for Giddy deal made sense. I think in retrospect, like that didn't age particularly well. But mm-hmm. the idea that Giddy is available from OKC clearly doesn't seem like he's going to fit their current timeline was obviously a problem in the playoffs um, in the bad way. But are these the kind of players that the Nets should be targeting going forward in this kind of like reset rebuild mode that they're in? And is he the kind of guy that, you know, sort of threads the needle on not necessarily knowing what the future holds, but trying to get sort of maybe depressed assets from other teams who are looking off him. I giddy. I think there's like a, compelling case to at least consider it um if not like go all in on it but i know sometimes fans don't want to hear names like this especially coming off the performance that he had in the playoffs but in my opinion like my opinion on giddy as a player is like not too much changed around the original idea that we threw out even if i think that that original deal you know clearly doesn't make sense now yeah, you know, he's coming into, if a trade was made by the Nets or any team for Josh Giddy, final season on club option, $8.35 million. So obviously you're talking about some risk in terms of him being a restricted free agent in 25-26. And if you're not going to intend to bring him in for the long term, are you giving away too much in terms of assets, draft capital, players, or otherwise? But we talked in our last episode, a very good episode, an A, <laughs> an a plus rated episode by almost everybody across the board. A plus, you know, let's just get, you know, I, I, I want to just be fair here. Yeah. Let's just say A plus plus. Okay? Yeah. Just because no, no, right. I, right. I want to, I want to be fair. And it's just like, I don't know. I don't want to downgrade us for no reason. So let's go A plus plus thinking about a third plus. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, and honestly, that's on me. It's on me. I, I, I tend to undersell and over deliver. It's constantly our model here now. When we talked about that A++ episode, possibly a future plus coming, look to Doug Norrie. The Dorian Finney-Smith to the Kings trade was, I talked to Matt George from Locked on Kings. He said, hey, that sounds that sounds like a player the, the Kings would really want, 13th overall pick in a week draft class. And then to turn around and see that Bobby Marks has been floating all of his ideas of how teams can improve this offseason. And it kind of started to reframe the value of Josh Giddy. When he said Utah might be an interesting landing spot for Josh Giddy, and having it come at a price point of 10th overall pick this year and then the uh, 2025 fo- top 14 protected, excuse me, pick from Minnesota, which Utah has control coming over from the Rudy Gobert trade. And when I saw that, it started to reframe it in a way, and to your point about a Nicholas Claxton for Giddy trade, well, that seems well off the table now. But if the Brooklyn Nets were in a spot, to pivot a, quote, weak draft class trade asset in the 13th pick, and then a player, which I'll bring up in a moment, into Josh Giddy. I can think of a dozen reasons. That's way overstating it. I can think of a few reasons why it would make a lot of sense for the Nets to take a very, very low risk on a player like Josh Giddy, who maybe as the season progressed for the Thunder, started to be, <laughs> familiar term, miscast in his role and no longer had the same value that he once did for that roster. Yeah, and like I, I honestly think the Nets are in a position where if like they feel like the superstar 
um, the all in superstar move might be a little m- even more fragile now than it was, you know, like yeah, let's yeah. say Mitchell yes. resigns with Cleveland. And now all of a sudden, like sort of like the superstar list of guys who might, you know, be interested in coming to Brooklyn is starting to deprecate a little bit. Like, I think that going back to a Sean Marks way of doing business in the past was kind of like picking up guys who might have mm-hmm. worn out their welcome in a current location, had some pedigree, Right. Like could probably maybe rehab a little of their value a la, you know, D'Lo and guys like this. And all of a sudden, you know, flip it, you know, put them in a new role where they might not be, you know, might have a little more agency around just like what to do on the court. Like there's a lot of things here that do line up for Giddy. And, you know, just from a Josh Giddy angle, you know, OK, well, let me just get this out of the way. He had some controversy in the year. Yes. The NBA did not investigate it further. They moved on. I do think there's a scenario where like the Nets just look at that and that alone is reason to never even just like the threat of controversy. Of yeah. Yeah. Head down the path. So before anyone comments on that, I- I'm we're aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> like just do- no reason to leave a comment about that. We get it now strictly from a basketball perspective. Yes. From a basketball perspective, your last lasting thoughts of Josh Giddy are getting played off the court in the playoffs where he basically was a starter and name only. And like in the Dallas series was rendered to like 11 minutes a game. And that was kind of it. If you, what, if you head back though, and look at it from a high level, you have Josh Giddy. He's 21 years old, right? He's six, eight. He can handle the ball. He, there's aspects of his game that would line up actually pretty well with what the Nets currently need. There was high draft pedigree when he first came in, right? Like lottery pick and OKC probably maybe reached on him a little bit, but I don't think that was like total consensus at the time. Pretty high basketball IQ, can do a lot of things well. We'll go through some of that stuff. But like these are the times, I think, in general, where a team like the Nets should be taking some risk. And the risk is actually pretty low, probably. um, Around pedigree, talent, size, and we'll see what we get. Right. And I think Giddy checks a lot of those boxes, and you have to look. And the thing is, too, is like, hey, you got played off the, the court in the playoffs against a team that's in the finals. Okay, great news. Nets aren't going to be in the finals next year. So let's <laughs> see. Like, right? Let's also frame it in the context By the way, of what the Nets are so good that Josh Giddy gets played off the court in in like right. in the, you know in the Western Conference Finals or whatever. Okay, then I or semifinals. Then I guess we'll all live with it oh, up until yeah. that point where the Nets aren't there. You can you could slot him in on this team and probably tell yourself a pretty clean story of like what the, the offense at least would look like. And I'll be really impressed if the Nets get played off the court in the Western Conference because the pivot from the East to the West is going to be dramatic. Coming up here in a second, we'll talk about the skill set, the fit of one Josh Giddy, and then ultimately, who is that player to be named that gets this deal done for OKC? We'll talk about that all coming up next. All right, before we get to that, tell you about our friends over at Prize Picks. With Prize Picks, you can turn $10 into $1,000 in a single game just by watching your favorite sports this summer. You can make a Prize Pick lineup in as few as 60 seconds. You just got to pick more or less on two to six players' uh, stat projections, and you're completely locked in. And when I say more or less on those stat projections, like with NBA, you got one more game here with the finals. You're going more or less on the points, rebounds, blocks, assists, steals, the MLB. You're going, you know, Ks, home runs, hits, all the stuff that you like to follow along, either when you're watching live or with the box score, you're picking two to six players. You're going more or less turn $10 into a thousand. Prize Picks America's number one fantasy app. It's got over 5 million active users. Get into daily action with your friends. Become part of the Prize Picks community. Look, this is daily fantasy just made so, so easy. You're not wrangling with salaries. You're not going against sharks in the water. It's just you against the Prize Picks proje- projections. Call it a day. Download the Prize Picks app and use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Download the Prize Picks app. Use that code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right. So as we continue today's locked on nets episode, talking about a potential pivot trade. If the Brooklyn Nets sent Dorian Finney Smith to the Kings and got the 13th overall pick, could they turn around and send that to Oklahoma city in exchange for one Josh Giddy taking a low risk flyer on a player who has one year remaining on a club option. The player just to round out the, the, the trade conversation here, I thought about initially saying, well, maybe they send Dorian Finney-Smith to the Thunder, right? Give them a veteran, a 3 and D wing. But then you go and look and see that OKC was one of the best three-point shooting teams in the league. Their defense was already really strong. Like, it'd be harder to, I think, sell Dorian Finney-Smith to OKC, though maybe he has value beyond their role in that team. The Dayron Sharp of it all, though, 
is the player that I looked on the Brooklyn Nets roster and said, what is the Nets plans here? Do they Are they planning on bringing him back? Are they going to give him a new contract? He's in the same boat as Cam Thomas, though we assume Cam Thomas is going to get a contract at some point from the Brooklyn Nets down the line here. Same thing, almost like Josh Giddy. The sl- smaller role, but De'Aaron Sharp got kind of played out of the rotation on a bad team, on a team that wasn't going to the playoffs, that wasn't going to the Western or Eastern Conference Finals. This is where I think it helps improve their rebounding. It's an area of weakness, especially on the offensive glass. You can kind of just label Dayron Sharp as a, hey, come in, do exactly what you do. High energy, go get a bunch of rebounds for us. Probably offers value to Oklahoma City. Do you think that that's enough? A 13th overall pick in a weak draft class combined with a Dayron Sharp to move off a player that it looks like the Thunder are ready to move on from anyway. No, it's probably not enough. And actually, I, the reason I know it's not enough is because I know if I just we threw this out in the old trade machine and then uh, put it out there for the internet masses, it would probably just be ratioed pretty hard uh, by OKC fans, rightfully so. I get what you're saying, though, in terms of like sort of fit. If, the, if they need a bigger center that you can maybe pair alongside Chet, um, a guy who just does rebound the heck out of the ball in day yeah. which he really does. I mean, re- rebounds per minute. He's one of the very best in the whole NBA. Now, the minutes were hard to come by later in the season. Part of that was clowny related, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, it just didn't seem like they were super committed to that. Now, new coach, and it's like a little hard to know what the overall path is here with Dayron. But in terms of just like straight up rebounding ability for a team that couldn't do it all that well, some rim running probably would pair with Shea okay on the offensive end. Like yeah. I could see it. I, I just know that if you threw this out there, people would see Giddy and then see Dayron, like you said, a guy that was dumpstered on a bad team, on a bad team, and yes. you're like, what? On a bad team that needed <laughs> rebounding often. That often needed rebounding help. He couldn't get on the court to do but that. But the assessment thing. is correct. The assessment yeah. is like at least a starting point. It's clearly not the, the right value, but yeah, in terms of like the Nets do happen to have this guy, and if you are a team that desperately needs like sort of backup center rebounding, like this is the guy, right? Yeah. Like this is kind of the guy, and you could. I think there's a version of this where like Dayron, if you like Lucas Kaplan did a really good piece about this early in the season where Dayron made massive improvements this year. They just didn't play yeah. him enough. Well, if you watch it year to year, like he has made real, real improvements. They just didn't get to see it consistently. So I think like the, uh, the, uh, the thesis is correct, but obviously if we put this, I, I wouldn't even bother because well, by, the, be by like, the way, when, as I turn the mechanics in my brain about like, okay, you know, Josh Giddy on his way out, look at the trade. I stopped short of putting this out there to the masses. I was like, it doesn't yeah. quite, it doesn't quite pass the smell test here. And the other, the interesting thing about it, before we talk about Josh Giddy's fit and skill set, just in terms of a trade like this is it, it, this is where it gets weird because when you look at the Nets roster, you go, well, who are the other guys? You know, we, we all, we understand that the high level, Oh, Mikhail Bridges make these big trades. But after that, it's hard to kind of label a role guy or multiple role guys that you would float or fit in it. And who knows? Maybe I, maybe it should be Dorian Finney-Smith and Dayron Sharp is the core premise sending to the Thunder to get back Josh Giddy. Maybe that's more interesting from an OKC standpoint than getting a 13th overall pick in a weak draft class when the Thunder have 9,000 picks going forward. Like That's probably the hardest part, I think, for the Nets or any team when it comes to acquiring Josh Giddy. It's like, ah, well, we'll give you we'll give you a pick in a future draft. Like, great. They have, I think, three first round picks in 2025. Like, yeah, you know, they don't like, need picks. Like, yeah, like, they don't at need some picks. point. They got to turn it into something, right? Like, that's right. what they need to do is turn it into the missing piece or the missing player. And obviously, Dayron is not that guy for this. I just wonder. I wonder what other teams around the league are going to come to the table with X offer for Josh Giddy. That's what I think actually becomes kind of fascinating in all of this. It's what is the NBA thinking about Josh Giddy right now? You might need a Nets, a Wizards team, right? That type of roster, that type of team that says, yeah, we'll take a flyer on a young guy to see what he could be because we don't have this ceiling of expectations. Look, I mean, like Giddy last year, if you just take the larger sample size, um, you know, Giddy without Shea, it was more than 650 minutes. They had a almost 120 offensive rating. Now, look, right. they had other guys, but Shea's clearly the hub there. And when he wasn't playing, like Giddy was the de facto point guard, sort of like at least like lead ball distributor with that squad. Again, they have Jalen Williams. They have other guys. They have Chet. They have other guys. But, I mean, the offense was still awesome with Giddy on the court. Defense was yeah. not great by 117, but still it's like almost a plus three positive net rating. Again, with Giddy, no SGA. And I think that's the reason the reason I backed that SGA is because like this is like, you know, he's the guy, he's not coming along. Right. So no, oh, oh like, sorry. Yeah. Well, we're not getting we're not getting him in the trade. Does he not throw right, him? Because in? like 
Giddy on the court with Shea last year was like a plus 11. It's okay. Yeah, well, one of those guys isn't coming in the trade. So let's, right. let's look at sort of what happens when Giddy just has the ball in his hands more, when things are more just turned over to him, when he is leading the break. And like he, or, you know, when he is just like sort of pushing, pushing the pace, he rebounds the position really, really well. He, again, he's huge. He's six, eight. Now it's weird because yeah. he's six, eight, but it's kind of all below the rim for him. Yeah. Right. Cause it's like not incredible burst. They don't, like, there's not crazy athleticism. So I wouldn't say he necessarily plays like he's six, eight. Um, but in general, like his rate stats play pretty well. The shooting has not really come around. That's his biggest problem, right? 31% from three at the guard position is just like not good enough. He's 21. Can it improve? I don't know. I will say the one part of the tape that I would believe is watching him, at least in the playoffs and over the course of the year, I mean, the shot does look bad. So it's a, yeah. a little hard to sell yourself on the story of this improving massively because the mechanics do look rough when given the opportunity and he was given opportunities in the playoffs because Dallas was more than happy to let him shoot. Right. But so that it's, it's like, you can sometimes be like, Hey, if the shooting comes around, I'll be good. I'm like, it's a little hard for me to see it, but in look in terms of like, just putting on the court with a guy like guys like Cam Thomas and Mikhail bridges and being able to take some of the ball handling stuff, he can still get to the rim. He, like I said, he rebounds, he pushes pace. I, I there's a lot to like, I, 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 I really want to stress that looking at the larger sample size and fit and yeah. fit. Yeah. I, I think the fit would be good. Like this checks to me, all the boxes on a guy that you want to trade for. If you're in the Nets position, what had what a high pedigree yeah. values down. There are, we have a lot, a big basketball sample where it's at least a positive, if not perfect. And there's a team that just kind of doesn't see him fitting with their, with their move going forward. And like, that's where the Nets should be kind of sweeping in on this stuff. And, and, you know, even, uh, listen, is it a funky shot? Is it going to come around? These are reasonable question marks. Now, the field goal shooting actually took a little bit of a dip to 47.5% this past season uh, in OKC. But three-point shooting, he's improved year over year. You know, he took almost four in his rookie season, only took three this past year. But from 26 up to almost 34% from beyond the arc, the free throw shooting, he's only getting the line, as you mentioned, below the rim, not a lot of attacking action. Only there a little over one and a half times a game, but shot it at 80% this past season after shooting 70 and 73. So whether or not we think there's that next level of it, at least things are tracking in the right direction, that the percentages are marginally improving year over year. And you can squint and think about how that can be applied for the Brooklyn Nets. Obviously, the rebounds and assist numbers are going to be down as he plays seven minutes, six, seven minutes less this season overall than he did the year prior. So coming up here in a second, not only the fit for Brooklyn here in the short term, how can it benefit the other players on the Nets roster? And ultimately, would you, Douglas Norrie, put in a future first round pick to make a move like this happen? We'll get into it all as we wrap up today's Locked On Nets show in one moment. All right, before we get to that, tell you about my friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. Look, LinkedIn Jobs is the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. When you're hiring for your small business, you got to find quality professionals that are right for the role. This is where LinkedIn Jobs can step in. It's not just another job board. LinkedIn's a vast network, more than a billion. That's what the B, billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find really anywhere else. It does it all while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. That's less than a day for the people that can't do the conversion rate on that. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats. You might not have the time or the resources to hire. They're just constantly uh, finding ways to make it easier. They just launched a new feature that actually helps you write the job descriptions, making it even quicker and even easier. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, so as we tie a pretty little bow on the Locked On Nets podcast, we talk about Josh getting a potential trade bringing over the expiring contract from OKC and what it would mean for the Brooklyn Nets. Listen, in the short term, you mentioned it there about the fit, getting the ball out of Cam Thomas's hands, having another player on the court who looks to facilitate, has the height to see over the defense. Like, there is a ton to like, even if this was only an effort for a one year and it's still open to back up to, well, are we going to bring them back? Are we pursuing big time free agents? Whatever the case may be. When we look into that backcourt, as we know, you brought over Schroeder. Okay, that, that certainly helped you veteran presence. No understanding about what Ben Simmons is going to be going forward. Bringing in a ball handling facilitator is always a good idea for the Brooklyn Nets. And I think sometimes, especially when it comes to the young players, Cam Thomas right now, already establishing himself, Noah Clowney. I think it always makes sense 
to even if it's not the long-term answer, bring in a player that can help them continue their development in the right in the right way, right? Banking on Ben Simmons being there and being healthy. Well, what if he goes down? Now you've reduced those ball handlers. You reduce the players that allow the other guys to kind of slot into their roles. That's half the reason I like it is because Josh Giddy is the mold of player you want for this team going forward, if not him exactly. Yeah. So, and I, and I, that, I mostly, I actually, I just totally agree with everything, especially when you're looking at, like at his eight, like age, 21 years old. I, like this gets forgotten too. Sometimes when guys have been around for a little while and you feel like you've seen a big sample size, you kind of get into this mold of, well, we know exactly what you are. It's over. No more, no more growth coming. Game is what it is. You can say that when a guy's 28 or 27 or 26, like, but the guy's 21 years old. It's actually a testament to like the skill that he's had this many re NBA reps at this young of an age. And again, yeah. narratives change because sometimes you're, you know, a bit overexposed or you don't reach the quite the heights that people wanted you to reach, right? When you're a top overall, you know, top 10 overall pick, guys want you to be kind of in that superstar track. Not everyone makes it. Okay, fine. But when you've had, when you've logged this many minutes, at 21 years old, I mean, clearly on a good team, by the way, like OKC yeah. is a really good team. Um, so when you've logged this many minutes on a really good team over the course of a few years, I mean, they weren't good the whole time, but, you know, they were good this year. Um, that just is a good thing. <laughs> like, yeah. but I, and I know it's like a little sometimes too easy. Basketball narrative speak is a little too easy to trend negative because it's one, it's last thing you saw. And then two sometimes your success begets more negativity because you don't reach like, because the, because the growth isn't linear, you end up stopping at a negative piece wherever your growth stopped, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, Oh, can a team win with Luca? It's like, I don't know. They made the finals. So yeah, probably. Right. So it's like everyone's, but, but the negativity just kind of drips in but that goes all the way down the scale too with a guy like Giddy. So long story short, even with all this built in, I still think these are the kind of the right guys. Developmental track, young. Buy low, seems like it, right? Some pedigree, yes. A chance to rehab in a new situation where you just look different in a new scheme where it might be yeah. a little bit more about you. That's these are all good things. Like these are all these are all the elements of something you want to kind of come together when trying to think about what assets to put together for a future that is uncertain, which is where the nets are. And by the way, it can help inform what the Nets want to do when it comes to the deadline and other veterans on this team. It's just like everything should always be about trying to inform what you want your future to look like and taking shots on some of these young players. Just to drill down even a little bit further, Cam Thomas, who's 22 years old, as we know, and has had a very rocky path, not his own problem per se, but organizationally to seeing minutes. He's played uh, north of 4,199 career minutes. That's what Cam Thomas has played over his first three, three seasons. Josh Giddy has played over 6,000 minutes. He has over no, almost 2,000 more minutes at the NBA level than Cam Thomas over those first three seasons. And in every game that he's played in, 54, 76, and 80 over his first three seasons, he started every one of those games. So even though, yes, played off the court and out of his role in the playoffs here, he is a guy that has been starting NBA level minutes for every single season that he's been a pro. And it certainly helps you. I mean, it informs, it informs your development. It's why we always talked about so negatively at times, the organization for stymieing what Cam Thomas can ultimately be because you just give him the reps, give him the reps, give him the reps. It only helps him get there in the end. And in the end, if I said, so from a Nets acquiring standpoint, is there any palette for, for you to look into the, Philadelphia first round pick, the Dallas first round pick, and say, we're not giving you Dayron Sharp because little little known secret here, whatever his role might be, that would actually create another void for the Nets where they need rebounding still. So say the Nets turn around and give you the 13th pick from a Kings trade for Dorian Finney Smith and one of those two firsts from Philly or Dallas. Is that palatable for you if that's ultimately what OKC wants? A a first round, another first round asset to work with down the road? I actually wonder, like a pick plus like the DFS plus Dayron. I think the money actually be too much at that point, but um, like that the price no DFS back. just giving them the thirteenth this year and a future first. You know, uh, sending yeah, yeah I would do that. I would. I think I one of like those non Phoenix picks. I would think hard about that, especially because those picks are not tracking to be like that good, right? Yeah. Because um, those teams are just good. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure that OKC says yes to that, but I do wonder like a pick plus the two players, like, and maybe they mm -hmm. have to bring something back, like uh, someone that's buried that just doesn't like have a role going forward. I, I'm not even like, you know, uh, like dang or someone like that. 
like me uh, that's i don't know that uh, probably not because it's giddy and, and i think okc is pretty shrewd with this i think they would probably just like try to ride it out and see what happens but i would do that in a second with the nets I, again like I, we've been a proponent of this I, they need to get younger if possible they need mm -hmm. to get okay younger with guys who actually play <laughs> like uh right they I, they have young guys on the roster but they don't actually play like when everyone wants to do this is when they you know they're like oh the nets had a really you know young roster last year it's like, like keon johnson doesn't count he didn't play i, I get right, he's young right, right. right? Uh, he's yeah, the, the average old. the average age does not include you cannot include the guys that come up for the cup of coffee over the course of the season exactly like okay oh Jay, well, Jalen martin's young he's like yeah he didn't play okay great um so it's like that you just can't use these guys as the thing they have to try to get younger so yeah again at the risk of sounding repetitive here i i do there are other guys like this around the league and we've taught we'll probably end up talking about some of them like these buy low assets the when you buy guys low it sounds uncomfortable to buy it this is why people have an incredibly hard time investing it's like well the stock market's down it's like yeah hey guess what what will probably happen it'll probably go back up right like <laughs> it's like i know it does not feel good to put your money in the stock market right now when it's low because your brain trains you to say low now low forever right or like right. buy a house when the housing market dies it's like Oh, buy low, buy it'll always be low forever. Well, it just won't. And now with pl basketball players are not commodities like, you know, like the other things, but it's also why it feels uncomfortable to talk about trading for guys when the price is down. Because if we all just traded when the price was up, like that's just not how the market works, <laughs> right. or you just end up overpaying. So while Giddy might not be the ultimate guy. I would stress to people to think about guys who at one point had a good reputation and that reputation might be down a little bit because of performance and whether or not that should preclude you from not considering it, it should not like these are the these are the opportunities you want to try to just sort of grasp. And the last two things, expectations as well. It's down on Giddy because the Thunder's expectations have risen. They need certain players because they have SGA. Right. When the teams are bad and you want good minutes, good NBA level minutes, that's what Josh Giddy was giving you for multiple seasons at the NBA level. And then the other note to make here is one, keep this in mind when we talk about highlighting draft prospects because this is the other option. Go for players like this if they're available around the league. And two, just to Doug's point, Dorian Finney-Smith and Dayron Sharp for Josh Giddy. Forget about the the picks for right now. That money works. You can get that deal done going with OKC. They take on almost ten and a half million in additional salary, but it gets underneath their cap, so they could do that for those two players. And then maybe a Philly or a Dallas first round pick. It's something to certainly consider on a couple of players for Brooklyn that, at least at this moment, for different reasons, don't have long term futures with the organization. All right, we are going to get out of here. Another right. week in the books of a locked on Woo. next. Look at Next that. week, we'll talk Ripping. about all about the uh, the expiring trade exceptions that the Nets are probably going to use. I'm kidding. They'll never use those. Uh, there's a, no, one, no one loves to collect TPEs and then just let them expire like the Nets do. But <laughs> we will be back talking all things New York uh, Brooklyn basketball. Make sure that you subscribe over to Locked On Nets on YouTube, where we mm -hmm. march our march our way toward 8,000 subscribers. Yep. Make sure you listen and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts as well. An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Why that is Benny Franklin. Oh, one of the all-time great poets. We're back again next week talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball. Basketball, 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 basketball. Yeah.